long before quitting Mr. Johnson's ministry became the craze of the day. And then de rigueur, Lord Frost resigned as Minister of State and has spent six months watching everyone else come around to his position. And he uh, joins us uh, now. Uh, I'm not expecting you to endorse any of these fellows, but what are you, what are you looking for in the next prime minister? So I, I may endorse somebody, mm. uh, who knows, mm. in the next uh, week or so. But, yeah, I'm looking for somebody who is properly committed to Brexit and mm. so talk about what that means. Somebody who is going to take economic policy on a different path. We need mm. tax cuts. We need fiscal support. We don't need continuity, Philip Hammond, as mm. the uh, economic policy for the next mm. few years. We need a better approach to net zero. We mm. obviously can't be done. Uh, in mm. the way that we're approaching it, that needs to change. And I mean, let's hope we never get into the COVID pandemic thing again. But mm. obviously, vaccine passports can't, you know, should not be done, should not be done. That mm. was the reason I, I left. So you're right, we are getting back onto, you know, a path mm. perhaps that I hoped we would. Um, immigration mm. is the thing that's missing from that. And obviously, we need to cut the numbers over time. That's that's what I think people voted for, amongst well, many other things. That comes, as Patrick Christie was just saying last hour, that comes up again and again as a core uh, issue of Tory of the Tory base. It, there's something bizarre in the way that France, which has a third of the population density we do, is shipping humanity to us. And the, essentially, this present government has just washed its hands of it. Yeah, I, I mean, to be fair to uh, the, the still prime minister, I know he did work really hard on this, this mm. question. And I don't think he's been complacent about it. It is very difficult, given the legal framework that we're in at the moment. Mm. We've got to make the Rwanda thing work, I think. I think that is the solution in the, the short run. But, of course, the small boat issue is only a still quite small mm. proportion of the number of people who come to this country every year. And you, we, you're right. We're a very dense country and there's a limit. Well, I, I think the limit has, has been reached, uh, I would say, certainly by comparison with most of Western Europe. When you say the legal framework, do you mean uh, essentially the European Court? So I mean the European Convention of, of Human Rights. Mm. I, I don't think it's necessarily um, a, a sort of inevitable that we have to, to leave it. I mm. think um, the, the ideas that Dominic Raab has for the, the Bill of Rights mm. could find a way through solving the legal mm. framework problem. Maybe we'll need to derogate from bits of it. Uh, mm. I think we just need to be a bit more forceful in pushing this framework to try and deal with the problem. How did we end up with a situation where if you're uh, what we used to call a colonial subject uh, on the Turks and Caicos or South Georgia or wherever, your final court of appeal is the Privy Council. But if you're actually in the heart of the metropolis, uh, you get to have your case adjudicated by an Albanian or an Azerbaijani or whoever they happen to assign it to. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a, a particular case of the general thing we've seen over the years yeah. where international institutions have accreted more and more power over time. And, mm. you know, a statement of general principles in the early 1950s in mm. the Convention on Human Rights has become a very strong binding legal framework in the usual way. And that is the that's the problem. We've given given all the difficulties that the, and and the, and and Mr. Johnson's ministry sometimes protests that it's up against the law and it can't be seen to be going against that. Uh, why then are we creating vague and ambiguous law in the so-called online harms mm. bill? Well, um, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I think that bill needs to be radically rethought. I think it needs to be stopped for the time being. Yeah. There's certainly some things in it that I think are relatively uncontroversial and probably could go forward. But the core provisions, the um, legal but harmful 
uh, concept, yeah. the change to the um, communi malicious communications law. I mean, mm -hmm. these are risks being really, really damaging to free speech. And yeah. we, we absolutely should not be doing that. And it needs to be stopped and it needs to be rethought. And I would say, you know, rethought involves putting it in the waste paper basket to a large extent. And going back to the drawing board. Going back to the drawing yeah. board, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, the internet um, is a different world for mm -hmm. speech. It is right that we try and kind of keep abreast of that, but the fundamentals have got to be free speech. If you can say something offline, and mm. they're all too, you know, that is getting constrained, but yeah. certainly uh, if you can say it offline, you've got to be able to say it online nowadays. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that would seem fairly uh, obvious. Uh, let's, let's talk about you. The last time you were here, um, I, I brought up the 1963 Peerage Renunciation Act, which was designed so that 14th Earls and 2nd Viscounts back in 63 would be able to run for the Tory leadership. We have a great lack of 14th Earls and 2nd Viscounts in the present Tory leadership race. But I gather the law has since been changed uh, so that uh, a peer such as yourself can now actually renounce a peerage and run for Downing Street. It, it was changed. Um, I didn't know this when I resigned, but I've since learned that uh, it is possible to uh, not renounce your peerage, but renounce your seat in the House of Lords okay. and um, stand for, for Parliament. And a, a lot of people have been kind enough to say I should. Mm. Uh, and I will t I'm turning that over <laughs> and we'll see what the, the opportunities are. It, I, there is a small matter of actually winning uh, yeah. an election, which has not been massively straightforward for the Conservatives recently, but, no. but 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 let's see. So it can be done, and um, I'm certainly, if people want me to do it, then I would, you know, I'd, I'd take that prospect seriously. Is the whole uh, I don't have time to quit the House of Lords while they're about to vote in the next 20 minutes? Is it a bit of ru a, a ruse, perhaps, in that the next Tory leader? is likely to be the person who gets to lose the next election and it's the next but one Tory leader that will be the consequential figure. So, I mean if there's an implication in your question <laughs> that um, uh, I might be the next but one uh, I would um, I would sort of uh, squash that I think I don't think um, I, I mean a lot of people have been kind enough to say to me they, yeah. they think I should be in this campaign I don't uh, I'm not a politician by by trade by yeah. training um, I, I, I don't think uh, I am in any way the right person to be leader of the Conservative Party. I think it just should be but, absolutely but wait, wait, clear wait, about that. At a certain point, uh, you know, people don't never want career politics. Donald Trump wasn't a career politician, but just to be bipartisan, Justin Trudeau was basically a high school drama teacher. I mean, uh, so around the world, Emmanuel Macron was just some sinister Goldman Sachs globalist figure. So all around the all around the Western world, people seem to be looking beyond the, the career politicians. I mean, maybe that's that's true, actually. Mm. I, and I think, you know, career politicians have not done so well. And I think one of the things Boris brought to this was that he wasn't really I mean, he managed to mm -hmm. kind of be a career politician and not at the same time. Mm. And that was his his strength. Mm -hmm. But 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 I think, you know, I've got certain skills. I've been in government for 30 years. Mm. I know how government works. Mm. Um, if the next prime minister, whoever it is, wants me to be involved, obviously, that's that's for them. But, mm. I, I, you know, I think beyond that is 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 not sensible and not practical and in any case the leader has to be uh, an MP. You, do you think that's true? I mean at the time, I, I mean most famously uh, in whatever it was 1940 uh, Lord Halifax uh, thought that he couldn't govern from the Lords mm. and that's partly why Winston Churchill uh, got the top job instead of him. But do you think that's these days with bazillions of life peers and uh, of Tony Blair's creation run, do you think people still feel about the Lords in that way? 
I, I mean, I don't know whether it's a constitutional requirement, but it is a Conservative Party requirement. It's in the mm. constitution of the party that is nowadays it? that the yeah. leader has to be an MP. So, um, and I think rightly so. I've said uh, quite often that you can only do serious politics uh, in mm. an elected house, and mm. if you're elected, and I think that's that is right in a democracy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that seems reasonable, and I think we should stick to it. Okay, okay. That's uh, but it's it's good to know that you actually can stand for a seat in the Commons if uh, one does become available. So we, we shall watch that with uh, interest. Uh, and it is fascinating to me, as you said, that that thing was changed. I have no idea why that change was made in 2014, but someone has to, someone will take advantage of it and it might as well uh, be you as uh, well uh, as uh, any other. Thank you very yeah, much for joining us, uh, David Frost.